Good morning and welcome to Christ of the Hills United Methodist Church. I'm Rev. Siegfried Johnson, Senior Pastor here in Hot Springs Village at our church, and I want to welcome you to a little corner of my study. And we would have been in the sanctuary today, this the last Sunday of our January and part of February suspension of in-person worship, and we would have been in the sanctuary recording a fuller service for you. But we've got some technical glitches this week. We're waiting on a new camera camera to replace our new camera. I should say a newer camera to replace our new camera, and that will be up and running very soon. But we decided just to bring you a devotional today on this Transfiguration Sunday. And then, of course, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the 40 days of Lent, and we will come back for in-person worship at 5 o'clock. Uh, weather permitting, obviously. We've got some inclement weather coming in, it looks like. And so do check that and be very careful. But 5 o'clock Wednesday is the plan for Ash Wednesday services. We won't be uh, doing the imposition of the ashes, obviously, because of the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, but we will have the service and in symbolic ways remember the meaning of Ash Wednesday as we launch into the season of Lent. So we hope to see you. If you are going to come, please try to either online or by telephone let us know, register so that we can follow all the guidelines of masking and so forth that we, uh, social distancing that we've been uh, already having in place from uh, in-person worship through from July through December. But we felt with the uh, spike of infections and hospitalizations post-holiday, Thanksgiving and Christmas, that we suspended in-person worship for January through February the 21st. And so next Sunday is February the 21st, and of course we will be back in in-person worship. So please register your attendance, either online or by calling. But this will give me an opportunity to really get uh, messy with you, to get messy with Bible study on Transfiguration Sunday and share a message with you that I hope will be meaningful and a blessing uh, for you. So today is Transfiguration Sunday. Let's pray together before we read the text. Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing. Yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ, whose compassion illuminates the world. Transform us, Lord, we pray, into the likeness of the love of Christ, who renewed our humanity so that we may share his divinity. The same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives with you and with the Holy Spirit. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, what I want to do today is to begin by reading the Transfiguration passage from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, this is the first eight verses of Mark chapter 9. And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothing became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. That's the transfiguration account from uh, Mark chapter 9. And what I want to talk about is verse 5. What did Peter mean when he said, let's make three, he said dwellings here in this particular translation, which is our Pew Bible, the uh, New Revised Standard Version, three dwellings. I want to ask the question, let's make three what? 
What was Peter saying? So I want to take advantage of our technical difficulties to do something here with you that I don't have the opportunity to do when I'm in the pulpit. I want to read multiple versions, not of the full text we just read, but just of verse 5. And it's a study that I think will lead us from the lessons of the Transfiguration all the way to saying a happy Valentine's Day to you on this February the 14th. The first version I want to read here from verse 5 only is the New International Version. Here's how verse 5 reads. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, the next version I want to read is from the message. And this is chapter 9, verse 5 of the message. Peter interrupted, Rabbi, this is a great moment. Let's build three memorials. Memorials. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, the old King James Version from 1611. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elias. So we have dwellings, we have shelters, we have memorials, we have tabernacles. Let's do a little more. This is the Jerusalem Bible from Mark chapter 9 and verse 5. Then Peter spoke to Jesus, Rabbi, how wonderful it is for us to be here. So let us make three tents, tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I won't read all the French. I'm not sure I could, but this is the French Bible, chapter 9 and verse 5. Rabbi, il est bon. It is good for us to be here. Let us make three tentes. Tents. Same, the French word for tents. This is my German Bible, which I know probably a little bit better than than French. But Rabbi, es ist gut. It is good for us to be here. Let us make drei Hutten, or huts, Hutten, huts. Let's make three huts. And finally, my favorite the Orthodox Jewish Bible. This is a group of Messianic Jews in the translation of this Bible who mix the Hebrew with the English. And this is Mark chapter 9 and verse 5. And in reply, Reb, it is tov, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three sukkot, sukkot. Let us make shalosh sukkot, three sukkah. Three, sukkah. What in the world is a sukkah? And where to begin? Well, to begin, all of these translations are right. None are wrong. However, I think that some enter our ears wrong. Our New Revised Standard Version, which is our Pew Bible, the very first version I read, for example, uses the word dwellings. And yes, that's true. Dwellings is what Peter is saying. Let's make three dwellings. But in my opinion, that's not a good translation for English speakers because we hear the word dwelling and we think of something fairly permanent, right? Uh, We think of one's home, one's, one's house, one's domicile, something with some permanence to it. My dwelling is where I stay, right? That's where I dwell. In another context, you may say that someone dwells on something, and by that you mean they have a hard time breaking away from it. It just consumes them. They're dwelling on it. So the passage is sometimes used to suggest that Peter is saying, let's just stay up here and never go down. Let's just stay up on the mountain. Let's build something with some staying power. The message, a translation, well, a paraphrase that I really love in most cases is probably the one I like least of these translations I've read today. He said, remember, let us make three memorials. Well, a memorial is certainly something that is meant to have permanence to it. Uh, You build a memorial, it's supposed to stay. And... uh, that I, uh, I don't think is what Peter is saying at all. I've used the text in that way, 
to say that Peter is saying, let's stay up here and let's never go down to the mountain. And honestly, it fits in a fairly good homiletic sort of a way uh, as a lesson to convey to, to uh, those who are considering this passage that we must come down from the mountain and re-engage ministry with those who are below. And that is true, but I think that's not the core of what Peter is saying. Remember, Peter was a Jew, as was Jesus. I think that what he was saying was quite the opposite of permanence. And to get to that, we need to know about the Jewish festival, a holiday season, commanded in the Torah, in the book of Leviticus, uh, the, of Sukkot, Sukkot, the Feast of Booths, to build a booth, the Feast of Booths, or Sukkot. These are tents and shelters. The plural of sukkah is sukkot. And that's where we get the name of this holiday. The word he used here in the Greek New Testament is actually skenos. Skenos. And it's the ancestor of our word skin. Think skin. Skenos. Skin. The word, we see it also in John, in the opening of John's Gospel in verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt. Here's that word dwelling. And dwelt among us. The word skenos there in skene means literally he took upon himself skin as his tent, as his tabernacle. Some versions would read, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. In other words, it was something that would soon be taken down. Uh, so the, this is the same word, by the way, that's used in the Old Testament for the t tabernacle where it was a tent to keep the Ark of the Covenant until they could get to something more, what? Permanent. Permanent. The building of the temple. So the key in all of these translations is something temporary. A tent of the flesh. We too will put aside these tents of the flesh, of skin, to enter the true temple of the Spirit in the presence of God. Is that not the core of our hope, of our message of hope, when we have a loved one who passes away? That the tent is a, a tabernacle, a temporary thing. And when it sloughs off, when it's gone, we enter the holy city, New Jerusalem, and its temple. Again, Peter was a Jew. He knew well about the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Sukkot. Sukkot this year, in the year 1920, 2021, I'm dated back 100 years, will be September the 20th through the 27th. Like our Easter holiday, this, this floats a little bit. Uh, we'll barely miss it. Our group going to uh, Israel on October the 12th this year, we'll barely miss it. But during that time, sprouting up all over Israel will be outside of homes, domiciles, dwellings, outside of that will be these huts, these tents, these temporary uh, shelters that will be put up, and they'll be festive. And uh, so this year, September 20 through 27, and the bottom line for these seven days that that, that Orthodox Jews will put up these huts outside their homes, the bottom line is this is a time to be happy. This is a time to rejoice. This all goes back to Leviticus chapter 23. So verses 39 through 43. Let me read a portion of that. And you shall be happy before the Lord seven days. Isn't that interesting? A holiday to be happy. You shall be happy before the Lord these seven days. On the first day you shall take the fruit of the majestic trees, the branches of the palm trees, and you shall be happy before the Lord for seven days. All that live in Israel shall live during these seven days in booths, in Sukkot, so that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel live in shelters, tents, booths, Sukkot, when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh your God. So this festival then is to remember that for the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the people of Israel had no permanent homes. They were living in tents, shelters that would be put up and taken down. 
So during Sukkot, observant Jews erect temporary dwellings. In modern times, not many actually sleep overnight in the temporary structures, but they may spend much of the day there, and they may take all of their meals there, especially in the sukkah rather than in the house. I chose the image that you're seeing now because it's right up against the permanent structure of the house, the stone structure of the house. Many will be put out in the deck or they will be on in the yard. Uh, some will be more plain looking, others will be festive and colorful and uh, have tables set up for they, they can enjoy meals there and, and so forth. So this is the, the Sukkot. But the primary message is to be happy. You shall be happy. Because remember that I delivered the people from Egypt. And I brought them, brought you into a promised land where no longer are you living in tents and huts and shelters. There are so many lessons about happiness that we glean from the wilderness. Happiness does not require permanence nor does it require extravagance. We can be happy wherever we are, when we are together. And that leads to another lesson. Happiness is best shared and best fed by our excitement of the fulfillment of our dreams. The Hebrew people, uh, when they were leaving Egypt and going to the Promised Land, they had no borders. They had no lands. They had no home. They had each other. They had each other and they had a dream, a dream that God would bring them to their promised land. So happiness too is temporary. It will be taken down from time to time. I think with all the lockdowns this year and people cooped up in the house, many may wish to live out in the tent for a while. I think when I was a child, I was remembering as I was writing this this morning that as a child, I, I loved UFOs. I loved to think about UFOs, and I had a friend like that. And I can remember with such clarity how one night mom and dad let us go out into the background in our little pup tent, and we spotted UFOs. I think we must have seen 10 or 20 each of us, pointing them out. Uh, to live in a tent, to get out. Happiness. Peter, in my opinion, spoke out of sheer joy, utter happiness, to have been chosen to witness this moment of glory. But he understood that like a sukkah, it would be taken down. It would soon be taken down. And he would have to go back to engage ministry in the world. Now, thinking that it must be taken down brings me to the second of two temporary dwellings that are known in Jewish life. And that's a perfect example for me to use uh, to wish you a happy Valentine's Day on this February the 14th. We've talked about the sukkah. Now I want to show you a hupa, a hupa. Now, a hoopah is a tent or a canopy under which a man and a woman stand when they are being married. The one I've chosen to show you is extremely festive and beautiful with the Mediterranean Sea, or at least a sea, I don't know where it's taken, but a sea that is in the background. All, it's a beach wedding, in other words. Uh, but hoopahs can be very, very plain as well, as long as it is a canopy or a tent structure. That's the most important thing. There must be a covering. For a man and a woman to stand under the hoopah is to step out of time and into a mythic time. It's as if they're walking, when they first step under that tent, they're walking out of this world into a liminal zone. Not quite heaven, but not quite earth either. One of the texts I've often used when I uh, officiated weddings is Jacob's ladder in the book of Genesis. How Jacob went to sleep and he had a vision of this ladder that connected heaven and earth and angels were ascending and descending on it and he recognized it as Beth El, the house of God, and uh, as uh, the gate of heaven. And so uh, Jacob didn't know really whether he had one foot in heaven and one foot on earth uh, or whether he was getting fully in heaven. But he did say this, how awesome is this place? I actually 
in my last appointment, married a couple. The, the husband's name was uh, Jacob. So I read this text, and I came to a point in the ceremony where I said, like Jacob, you may feel in between, not knowing whether you're in heaven or whether you're still on earth. And the bride looked at me and said in a louder voice than a mere whisper, I'm in heaven. I'm in heaven. I'll never forget that moment. It stopped me cold in the ceremony. And as I looked at her, she was just resplendent with joy. In Jewish life, the canopy, the chuppah, puts one foot in heaven when we step into mythic time. And that time, by the way, ends with a bang. It ends with a bang. I've officiated in several weddings of uh, Jewish persons with a Christian, and uh, so I've, I've officiated some weddings under the hoopah, and it ends with a bang. In other words, the crashing of glass. Uh, the minister will take a glass, sometimes that's a wine glass, it could be, even be a light bulb, and put it in, in uh, like a heavy velvet pouch, and then the groom, or sometimes both the groom and the bride, will crush it underfoot, smash it. And that's when the family and friends gathered together shout, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. This is a signal that mythic time is over. It's time to take the tent down and to re-enter the world. That was a mountaintop moment. But now it's time to re-enter the world. It was a mountaintop moment of festivity and happiness. But now it's time to re-enter the world. The message of the broken glass is much like the message of the broken world that Jesus and his disciples had to come back to when they came down from the mountain. And this is the message of transfiguration. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and we will, on Ash Wednesday, after this epiphany season since January 6th when light has been building and building and building, now in Ash Wednesday we descend back into the brokenness, into the darkness. There are many suggested symbolisms for the broken glass under the hoopah at the end of a Jewish wedding. Most prominent, perhaps the most well-known, the one you may have heard most, is that the temple has been destroyed. And uh, that's very well known. But also, I think, another message is that marriage is a covenant made through sacrifice one with another. The Hebrew phrase to make a covenant is literally to cut a covenant. In the time of the Old Testament, a time of animal sacrifice, covenants were marked with the sacrifice of an animal, literal cutting. So the shards of glass that are broken symbolizes that a man and a woman are entering into a covenant together. But most important in this ritual for me, I think, is that a remembrance that as pretty as this moment is, as festive and beautiful and meaningful as this moment is, this hoopah will be taken down and we will re-enter the world and life will engage its suffering. We have that in our vows, don't we? For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness as in health. We can't stop that from happening. That's life engaging our suffering. But that moment of breaking the glass to remember that those times will be shared reminds us that we can endure all such moments as one together and not allow them to make us either despondent and certainly not allow them to separate us. So I hope our hoopah will convey to you the wish for love that will be strong and abiding Valentine's Day kind of strong. So a transfiguration message and today and we'll come back together Wednesday at five o'clock and when we do we will recall that our bodies themselves are tense and they will be taken down. Which is the message of Ash Wednesday, right? When the ashes are placed on our forehead, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. Thank you for joining us on this Transfiguration Sunday for a devotional here in the pastor's study. I hope it's been a blessing to you and in many ways meaningful. And we certainly wish you a happy Valentine's Day on this February 14th. And we hope to see you in person next Sunday on February 21st. But remember, if you are not yet where you can come, 
to worship here with us. Uh, we will be online so that you can share the message together. So let's end with a prayer. O oh God, as your Son drew apart to be in prayer with you, we offer our prayers for the transformation of the world and for the church. You revealed your glory and your presence in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Reveal the glory and presence of your Spirit that is alive in the world today and free us, empower us to act as a transfigured people in the world. In Christ's name, Amen.